In any town in Britain, the public library is usually an easy building to find. Most people can direct you to it, because most people use the services of the library. Some are regular visitors every few days, while others only come when they want to find a particular book. There are those who make full use of the library's reference section for doing some complex piece of research work, and others who find adventure amongst the volumes. The free public library is a civic service which the town dweller grows up with and takes for granted. A centralised building feeding the book needs of 15,000 people works perfectly well in an urban district. But what of the townsman's country cousins? How can the county authorities supply the book needs of small, isolated communities scattered over a large area? Many county authorities in Britain have solved the problem by placing their rural service on wheels. I'm Sally Jenkins, a mobile librarian in the county of Hertfordshire. Right now, Thomas, my driver, is taking me to the first of today's village stops. The arrival of the mobile library once a fortnight is an awaited event in the life of every village in the county. And one or two of the older borrowers are usually making their way to the stopping place a few minutes before the van is due to arrive. The combined sounds of the church clock striking ten and the blast of a motor horn have only one possible meaning for the people of Danegate Village. It's Tuesday morning, their library day. The five mobile libraries operating in Hertfordshire ensure that every rural area in the county receives library service. Each mobile takes two weeks to cover its allotted area. My particular area is divided up into nine different routes every route being a full day's work. Four years ago, I was asked to take charge of a mobile library. It was to be the first mobile in the eastern area of the county, and I, for one, wondered if it would prove practicable. Any doubts were swiftly dispelled. The mobile was a success from the very first day. There are so many little things that make my job satisfying, chiefly my relationship with the borrowers a relationship which grows more friendly and intimate with every visit. Many factors probably contribute to this. The restricted floor space of our library. The definite, though brief, nature of our fortnightly meetings. My slowly acquired and applied knowledge of their taste in books and their expressed appreciation of the personal nature of the service. In Britain, all public libraries, whether they be a building in the town or a mobile in the country, are free libraries. They are paid for out of the rates, a form of taxation which finances the many services and activities of local authorities. All anyone has to do to join the mobile library is fill in an application card. No qualifications are required and there are almost no rules to observe. The county library service is free to everyone who cares to use it, because everyone contributes something to its cost as a ratepayer. But in Danegate, like any other village, some use the library and some don't. The schedule we work to allows us to stop in Danegate for 20 minutes only. Our schedule must be strictly kept to if all the villagers are to be served. Our next stopping place is the village of Ibbert, a mile and a half away. We allow five minutes for the journey. My day starts at nine in the morning when the mobile leaves our headquarters, the county library in Hartford. Getting from Hartford to our first stopping place may take anything up to an hour. For journeys as long as that, I sit up front with Thomas. But after our first stop, there's plenty to keep me busy while the library is travelling, clearing up after the last stop and preparing for the next one. 
our offer system is kept as simple as possible. Each group of tickets represents all the borrowers in a particular village. Attached to each person's ticket are the identification cards from the books he has borrowed. I have 2,000 borrowers on my routes and there are usually about 10,000 books in circulation amongst them. Any shuffling up of the tickets and cards would be a major disaster. The work I did while we were travelling prevents any delay in finding the correct tickets and I am able to deal with each borrower promptly. As givers of service, we're very grateful when it's our turn to receive it. On the days when the library visits Ibbert, we can always rely on Mrs. Clark to supply us with morning coffee. There are people like Mrs. Clark on every one of our routes. This thoughtful act is an hospitable welcome, indicating how much our brief fortnightly visits mean to the people of the rural areas. Among the 2,500 books carried in the mobile, we try to cater for all tastes, but obviously it's impossible to carry every book that's required. To cover special requests, we operate a reserve service. To reserve a book, the borrower fills in a special card. The large stock of books at our base, the county library, can supply most requests. For those it cannot supply, a search is made elsewhere. First, to all the libraries in the county of Hertfordshire, then to all the libraries in Great Britain, and if the required book is very specialised or rare, to overseas libraries which operate an exchange scheme. And so from one or other of these sources, the reader's request is supplied. In some ways, we're almost like a bus service, except that instead of carrying a couple of dozen people as passengers, we carry a couple of thousand books. Most of our routes are well off the beaten track, along minor roads and country lanes. On each of our daily routes, we make anything up to 20 stops, some 150 stops during the course of a fortnight. But this doesn't mean 150 villages. In the larger villages, we sometimes make two or more stops. And this is not simply a matter of convenience for the inhabitants. There's a very practical reason for doing it. One stop in some large villages would make impossible demands on our limited space. I'm responsible for planning the routes and compiling the timetables for the area covered by my vehicle. In doing this, I consult the wishes of the villagers and as far as possible plan the stopping time to suit them. No one wants the library time to clash with one of the village activities. The stopping places listed in the official schedule are those approved by the county authorities but we also give special service at isolated farms and cottages. Mrs. Watson's door lies on our route and the whole operation only takes a moment. At another of our special stops, the lady of the house is rarely at home when we pass her way, but she and I have an arrangement. I know the type of book she likes and she always leaves her to be return books in the same place. Mm -hmm. 
Because our borrowers are only able to use the library once a fortnight, there are no restrictions on the number of books they may take away. Mrs. Rogers always takes nine books on her ticket, but only three of these are for herself. The others are for her husband and son. This is true of a lot of borrowers. The books they take are for the whole family, not just themselves. There's no doubt that the success of our service is largely due to the neighborly attitude of those who use it. Mrs. Cook always changes books for some of her neighbors, one of whom is an elderly invalid. I've never seen this invalid lady, but I almost feel I know her through Mrs. Cook. In fact, I discover a great deal about many of my borrowers during our brief meetings. Mr. Dodds is the village schoolmaster, a first-class teacher, so my borrowers tell me. While Mr. Dodds comes to the mobile to change his books, some of his pupils are doing exactly the same thing in the classroom. Children of school age have no need to use the mobile. All their general reading needs are met by the school library. But the mobile does carry books for children under school age. Young John will grow up and take the public library service for granted, in the same way as his town-bred cousins. The music shelf is perhaps the most specialized corner of the mobile, and people like Mrs. Birch, the organist at Overbridge Church, make full use of it. Discovering people's interests, and thus their book requirements, is my job and my hobby. Mr. Merton, the great open-air enthusiast, Miss Farrell, who likes travel books. Robert Craig, who is studying for a university examination. Usually the first person in the library, he's always the last one to leave it. It's late afternoon, and time for us to depart from Overbridge and start on our last journey of the day. The people of Overbridge must now wait 14 days before they can change their books. But our borrowers are used to this and have laid in plenty of supplies. For Thomas and me, the day is almost over. Our final job is to take the mobile back to the Hartford base and check our stock of books. Check that there's sufficient variety to suit every taste. For tomorrow morning, promptly at 9 o'clock, we shall again set out to give library service on another of our routes. Thank you.